Right. And what was it that made it good? What was it that made it so amazing and wonderful? Last year, um, Rob took me to Yamato's for our anniversary. And that was an awesome meal. It was really fun, entertaining, watched them to do all kinds of stunts and things um, while I did that. That was great. Food was tasty and delicious and stuff, but I wouldn't say it was the best meal I ever had because I was hungry just a few hours later after that one. It was not very filling. It wasn't uh, the kind of stick to your ribs kind of food. It was delicious, but I don't know if it would, could qualify as the best. Maybe when I asked you what your favorite meal was, you were thinking about that traditional Thanksgiving dinner kind of food, right? The, all the trimmings, turkey and pumpkin pie and all that great food, green bean casserole and all of your favorites, right? Now, that's a meal that you are definitely not hungry after, right? You don't have to eat for days afterwards. But the problem is, that's exactly what you're going to have to do, right? With all those leftovers, you're going to be eating for days afterwards, and it gets kind of old. I mean, turkey once, great. Turkey twice. Turkey tetrazzini, turkey soup, turkey whatever. It starts to go downhill, right? So it starts out great, but eh, maybe not the greatest after all. How about church potlucks? Best meal ever, right? or an all-you-can-eat buffet where you can pick and choose what you like, a little bit of everything, right? Or better yet, here's, here's another idea. Um, how about the best meal ever, a combination of absolutely all your favorite foods? I've got, I've got one in mind. New York cheesecake, flaming hot Cheetos, deluxe pizza with mushrooms and anchovies, yeah, and top it all off, triple fudge brownie ice cream. All my favorites together in one meal, right? All my, no? Yeah, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but after you put that combination together, maybe not. A lot of meals sound really good, but the result afterwards, after you eat that combination, not so great. Maybe it wasn't the best meal afterwards, or maybe after you test your blood sugar and your cholesterol after you eat that greatest meal ever, you realize it wasn't maybe the greatest meal ever, right? Really good food is tough to find. A really good meal is a hard combination. I think the best meal will have a lot of different qualities in it. The best meal is gonna leave you satisfied. You're not gonna leave the table wanting more. The best meal is going to be enjoyable. You're going to like the food. You're going to like how it tastes. It's going to be that comfort food. But it's also going to be nourishing for you. It's going to have all the significant vitamins and minerals you need to keep you healthy. And it's going to provide the calories you need and the energy you need to get things done. Because the best meal oftentimes turn out not to be the ones that you think they're going to be. Jesus' disciples discovered this in our scripture reading today. I don't want to set uh, the stage before I get into the scripture. The scripture passage I'm going to read starts with Jesus going on a road trip with his disciples. They're traveling from Judea to Galilee, and it's a long trip, and they have to stop um, in Samaria for a rest stop, right? Uh, and Jesus is tired, and so he stops at Jacob's well to rest while the disciples do a, a road trip run and run to the Quickie Mart to get something to eat, right? So Jesus is sitting by the well waiting while the disciples have gone off to get food. And that's when he has a very powerful encounter with the woman at the well. She's an outcast woman with a past, and he, Jesus and this woman get into a really great theological discussion about living water and never thirsting again, and Jesus reveals to her that he's the Messiah, and that it thrills her, and she's so excited, and she runs to tell the rest of the village, come see this man who knows everything about me. Do you think he could be the Messiah? And as a result of what she says, tons of people come to believe in Jesus as the Savior. It's a very powerful time. But in the midst of all of this, the disciples come back from their trip to the grocery store and from their shopping trip, 
And while the woman is going off to talk to the villagers, we have a discussion about what's happening between Jesus and his disciples. And that's the part I want to look at with you um, together. If you, if you want to turn in your pew Bibles or look up on the screen, we're going to be reading from John chapter 4, verses 31 through 38. So it's John chapter 4, verses 31 through 38. So the woman has gone off uh, to tell people about Jesus. And we start in verse 31. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him, fo could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for, Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. This is God's word for us this morning. So, the good news is it's not just us that sometimes gets confused about what a good meal really is. The disciples were confused as well. They were confused is just the least of the saying. They offer Jesus something to eat, and what does Jesus do? He turns it down. He says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And when the disciples hear it, they're scratching their head. I mean, these are guys that I'm sure never fail to satisfy their own Big Mac attacks, and they couldn't believe what they're hearing. Not eat? Miss a meal? I mean, why, for heaven's sake, would anybody do that? And Jesus says, yep, indeed, it is for heaven's sake that I'm doing that. I'm missing a meal for the sake of the kingdom of God. My food is due to do the will of of him who sent me and to complete his work. Jesus says, my food, the thing that keeps me going is not on a plate and it's not in a bowl. My food is to do what God wants me to do and complete his work. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and that's the best meal deal ever. And when Jesus had finished telling the disciples about his energy for doing God's work, he then tells them, hey guys, I need you to open your eyes and look at your own job because the same thing is true for you. Do you not say four months more and then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you. Open your eyes and see how the fields are ready for harvest. You see, the real meal deal is not just for Jesus. He says, you guys too, you disciples have the real meal deal available. You've got a job to do. That's basically the same thing that Jesus said when he sent the disciples out in Luke chapter 2. Chapter 10, verse 2, he tells them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest fields. The disciples, too, are supposed to be about God's work. They are supposed to be ministering to people and spreading the gospel and bringing people to Jesus. And what was food for Jesus and what was food for the disciples can be food for us, too. It is not a stretch to remind us that we have the same calling as the disciples did. And in following that task, that's where we're going to find our nourishment. That's where we're going to find our fulfillment and satisfaction. We are confused these days about what good food is. And we are just as surprised as the disciples to hear Jesus' words that the real meal deal can be found in part by doing God's work, by building God's kingdom. You don't know what real food is until you've tried the stuff that God's provided for you. Working for the Lord is the best meal that you can have. Now I see some kind of skeptical looks on your faces. Really? Best meal ever, working for God? That's not any better than my mom's good home cooking, right? Or working for God better than all you can eat buffet? Better than a gourmet meal at a five-star restaurant? I'm here to say yes. I'm here to say yes, and here's why. Number one, being involved in God's work, being involved in ministry, is a food that will nourish you. 
Ministering to other people is about changing other people's lives. But usually we think that we are changing the lives of other people. But more often than not, the person who changes the most in ministry is the person doing the ministry. It's the way that we grow as Christians and become more like Christ. If you want to grow in Christ, if you want to learn more about God, if you want to learn more about the scriptures, you know what you need to do? You need to teach Sunday school. Seriously. Seriously. You will learn more, not by being a student, but by being a teacher. I guarantee you, ask anybody here who has taught Sunday school, and they will tell you, I think that they, as a teacher, have learned more and grown more as a teacher than their students have. Are you in hurting? Are you in need of comfort? Are you in need of encouragement? You know what you need to do? You need to go to the hospital and visit somebody. You need to go to the nursing home and visit a shut-in. I guarantee you that you will get more out of doing that ministry than they will. That's tr true. Last year, I had the opportunity to visit with Weva Garcia several times when she was very ill and when she was dying. And I went because I'm her pastor and I'm supposed to minister to her and be all pastoral. And I said I wasn't going to, told myself I wasn't going to cry during this. But when I was trying to minister to Weva, every time when I'm driving back from Cleveland Clinic or driving back from the nursing home or just driving back from her home, I came away more encouraged and more uplifted just by hearing her testimony, by seeing and feeling God's presence with her. It was so powerful. I'm the one, I think, that grew more than she did. When we help others, when we reach out to them, we are encountering Christ. And scripture is very clear on that. And we say, scripture says, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When were we a stranger and did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or see you sick and go visit you? And God replies, I tell you the truth, when you did it for one of the least of me, of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. There is more vitamins and more minerals for growing when we minister to others than in almost anything else that you will do. When you serve at the rescue mission, just watch how your own spirit of gratitude grows and how you, when you encounter the face of the God who has already rescued you. If you empty yourself, you're the one that's going to be filled. If you feed others, you're the one that's going to be fed. If you want a real meal deal, if you want a meal that's going to nourish you spiritually, then you need to go and do the work of the one who sent you. Being involved in ministry is a food that is going to energize you. It's going to propel you forward and push you in life. It's better than five-hour energy or a protein bar or anything. A lot of times we don't think about what it is that's going to keep us going in life until whatever it is that usually keeps us going gets up and goes. A lot of things push us on in life, but they all have a tendency to fizzle out and to crash. So I want you to ask yourself this morning, what is it that motivates you? What is it that causes you to do the things that you do? What's the reason that you get up in the morning? What motivates you in your personal life? Is it a paycheck and the promise of the weekend? Is it a family member, maybe a child, a spouse, or a parent that dictates what you're going to do that day? Or is it a deep and passionate longing to feed on the Word of God as He nurtures you and brings you into faith? God, His work, His Word, His will, those are the things that strengthened and energized and nourished Jesus. What is it that drives you day to day? Is it fame, glory, the hope that somebody's going to praise you for whatever task you've decided to take on? Is it a sense of power that you finally get, finally I'm in charge, and that's what motivates you? Is it the expectation of getting some recognition or something tangible for your efforts? Or are you motivated by the healing and saving power of Jesus Christ and His marching orders and carrying them out? Is that what drives you and directs you? What energizes you in life? Do you get your energy like I do from a drink? Whether it's Big B coffee or five energy, five hour, those little five-hour energy things or maybe some other drink. 
do you get your energy and you get your thrills by going to the mall and buying something that you need or didn't need? Is that what gives you that high? Or are you, do you get high and excited and energized by just being in the presence of God and by being led by the Holy Spirit and directed by Him? Because I hate to break it to you, but I guarantee you that you're going to crash when the caffeine wears off or when your 15 minutes of fame is up. You're going to run out of gas sooner or later if there is anything else driving your life other than doing the will of Jesus Christ. Only doing God's will is going to give you the sustaining energy that you need to keep on keeping on. And that's exactly what you need to do to get the full benefit of the meal that God has provided for you. You need to keep on keeping on and bring it to completion. The superfood that truly satisfied is not just doing the will of God. Because Jesus said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. And to finish his work. Not just start with the appetizers, but go all the way through the desserts and the after dinner mint. God's work is a meal that sticks to your ribs. It's not something that you eat and then find yourself hungry again a little while later. It's none of this frou-frou stuff. You know, the big giant plates with this little tiny piece of meat in the middle and a few fancy garnishes and the drizzle on the top. No. God's work is something that you can sink your teeth into. I like the new translations for my everyday, but the King James Version has it right on this one. It, the King James Version says, Jesus says, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. It's meat. It's something you can sink your teeth into. You know, sturdy stuff. We are not going to be completely satisfied with this meal of serving and doing God's work until the meal is over and the work is completed. We can't be satisfied until the job is done, until things are finished. I guarantee you that the best meal you ever ate was one that you actually finished, not one that you just took a few bites of that you started and didn't finish. Completion is where the fulfillment is, not in a job that was started and then just kind of left by the wayside. And that's what Jesus is pointing his disciples to. And he says, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe with harvest. He's saying, guys, the job's not done yet. The meal's just starting. It's not ending. The work's not going to be done until the harvest is complete. That's what he's saying in verse 36. Not until the harvest is complete. Not until the harvest is the harvest crop. Not until you harvest the crop for eternal life. Jesus is saying the job's not done. Yes, you have a job of ministering to hurting people, but it's not finished until they have eternal life. We can minister to people for all kinds of physical and spiritual needs, but it's not done until they know Jesus. We are called to a lot of different ministries in the kingdom of God. God calls us as individuals, and he calls us as a church to share Christ with the hurting world. But whatever form of ministry that takes, whether it's a prayer chain, whether it's going to the rescue mission, whether it's taking kids to camp, that job is not going to be completed until we tell people about Jesus. Whatever we do as a church... We have to do it as a church that is committed to the message of Jesus Christ. If we happen to have an exercise class, it's not just for fun. It's to teach people about being healthy in their spirit and in their body and how they can be spiritually healthy as well. If we have a great youth ministry, it's not just to herd teenagers in off the street and keep them out of trouble and be a good influence on them. It's to show them life in Jesus Christ. We have to tell the whole story. We have to give the whole gift. We have to harvest a crop for eternal life. We have to complete God's work. Because without telling people about Jesus, then feeding people at the rescue mission is just the same as, you know, free McDonald's Day. And having these amazing church lock-ins, that's just glorified babysitting. Those are nice, but it's not satisfying. The best meal is going to leave you completely satisfying when you finish it. That's where the real excitement is. That's where real fulfillment is and satisfaction. It comes when you finish the work, when you bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's where it's at. That's the real meal deal. Serving God is nourishing, it's energizing, it's filling. That makes it sound kind of like bran muffins and broccoli, doesn't it? But... I want to tell you that it is so much more than that. God's meal deal is enjoyable. 
It's good food that you will enjoy tasting. A lot of people think that Christian service, whether it's mission work or singing in the choir or a grief ministry or working in the nursery, oh, all right, I'll do it, but it's going to be about as exciting as eating oatmeal. It's not. It's something that's not that you are just obligated to do, but that you're not going to get anything out of now. Somebody gave Rob a, a cross stitch. I think it was when he was ordained. I forget when they gave it to him. But it, it's a lovely framed cross stitch. And it says, working for the Lord doesn't pay much, but the retirement benefits are out of this world. All right. Now that's cute. That's cute. And I'm sure whoever did it for them did it with love and were well-meaning. But you know what? That's not the complete truth. It's not the complete truth. Because you do not have to wait until you retire or expire to get the benefits of doing God's work. You can see it now. Verse 36 says, Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may be glad together. The joy starts now. The joy starts now. What could be better than seeing people come into the kingdom of God? Seeing people come to know Jesus, witnessing baptism, watching them grow in the Lord is a joy, and it's exciting. Those of you who know me know that I am not a real cheerful person by nature. I'm not. I'm, I am the glass half-empty kind of gal. But boy, let me tell you, when we have baptisms here, I'm, you would see a different face. I'm glad you're looking up there at the baptisms instead of looking at me down here. But my face is different when I see that going on. I'm practically giggling in the pews. I'm so happy. When I'm thrilled when I see our young people up front sharing a testimony or singing in the service. I'm excited when they're running back and forth in the back of the hallway, but they can stop and tell me the Bible lesson that they learned weeks ago. And when they tell me what they did with it at school, I'm excited when I look up front and see our graduates lined up at the front and remember how they started out and how you wanted to pull your hair out when they were little and seeing what they have grown into. It is exciting to see the results of serving God. It's a joy. Doing God's work is a fun and enjoyable meal. It is way happier than McDonald's happier meal. It is exciting. And you see the rewards right away. And I'm saving the kicker for last. To top it all off, it is really easy. It is really easy. The best meal that you have is almost always one where somebody else has done all the hard work for you, has done all the cooking. That's what verse 38 says. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. I don't want you to leave here with the idea that serving the Lord and doing His work is extraordinarily difficult or requires years of training and education. No way. This is not Gordon Ramsay top chef stuff. This is more like heating things in the microwave. The Spirit has already gone ahead of you and done all the hard work. We do not have to change people's hearts. We can't change people's hearts. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. All we have to do is share the love of Christ with people and let them respond. God's already done the hard work for you. This is easy peasy stuff, guys. I remember 20 plus years ago when I gave my first candidating sermon here. And Jeff Cecil came forward on that Sunday. Never saw this kid before. I'm preached a first time here preaching. And he comes forward at the invitation time to dedicate his life to Christ. And I'm thinking, ha, score! Yes, I won a soul for Jesus. First time right out of the gate, right? Pretty impressive, huh? No. No, I, I had other people in the pews that were head back, snoring away, so it wasn't all that great. But this is the first time that Jeff had ever heard me preach. It's the first time he'd saw me. I reaped what I didn't work for. I didn't do that. I was just the harvester. There were a whole lot of other people, half of whom are here, parents and grandparents and Sunday school teachers and all kinds of people who had been working with him and who had planted and tended and watered that seed until it blossomed and grew. And we, as a church, could rejoice in that day together, those who planted and those who harvested. It's an easy job. All you have to do is get up there and give the most boring sermon in your life, and God's going to be working 
and somebody's going to come forward. That was pretty exciting. But it is easy to serve the Lord. It's just simple obedience, to do the will of the one who sent you and to finish his work. The hard part has been done. There are opportunities galore for getting involved in ministry, for doing God's work. You have a smorgasbord of opportunities, and all you have to do is dig in. You can see a list of ways to become involved inside this church and outside this church. And I guarantee you it's going to be one of the best things that you can ever do for yourself and for the kingdom of God. You will not regret getting involved in ministry and in serving for the Lord. And I want you to explore that because I want you to have the best meal of your life and bite into the food that God has provided for you. I invite you to pray with me as our ushers come forward to receive this morning's offering. Will you bow your heads? Lord God, if we just lift up